Hi, my name is Matt Quayle. I am a composer for film and television. Um, I work on a number of shows, Mr. Robot, American Horror Story, Feud, American Crime Story, and um, yeah, we're here today to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, what, what, what I do here with all, with all this stuff. Mac, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to your studio. It's so great to chat in person. I know we've talked on the phone a couple times, so uh, really appreciate uh, your time today. <laughs> happy to happy to be talking with you. So to start off, I'd love to just kind of talk about your your intro and uh, kind of your introduction into music and um, kind of your background. Kind of growing up, when did you I guess find music, and at what point in your life did you decide to kind of create that into a, a career path like to what you do today? My parents uh, put me in the church choir, the Episcopal Church, at age six. Wow. Um, no advance notice. <laughs> we just got in the car. And, uh, oh, really? And then <laughs> here, here you are. And, uh, and that, was, that was the start. And, yeah. um, <clears throat> I sang in the church choir um, for probably six years until my voice changed. Uh -huh. And um, and then this like this whole sort of musical path unfolded from that piano lessons, high school band and orchestra, uh, then rock bands, um, and then I ended up in New York City mm -hmm. uh, at NYU, and I found my way into the recording industry there as a musician, a keyboard player, mm -hmm. programmer, right, um, and discovered dance music. And was was working on uh, all kinds of dance music uh, as a musician, and uh -huh. then uh, I started collaborating with the producers that were hiring me. Uh, so I was co-producing, co-remixing, and, um, and I did that for many years in New York wow. um, until sort of the early 2000s when the the music industry started to show its first signs of of trouble. Sales were going mm, down, yeah. and um, I thought. Hmm, maybe it's time to to look around for something else. Right. And uh, I thought, okay, I've been in New York a while. Maybe I should go out to the West Coast, uh, to it's Los a big, Angeles. It's a, big move. It's, a, it's a big move. Yeah. Um, and then there was a vague, sort of a vague idea of of scoring. Mm -hmm. And um, were you aware of it? I mean, were you aware of like film music as a as a thing? I was aware of it. Yeah. I definitely was aware of it. I, I had been enjoying it for many years. Yeah. Um, I, I wasn't super focused on it. Right. I know. I know I've heard other uh, composers say, you know, they they heard a certain score when they were twelve and they yeah. knew like that's what they right. wanted to do. <laughs> um, I didn't. I didn't really have that. That type of focused uh, experience, yeah, but yeah. Um, I did. Uh, I did enjoy it, um, and I, you know, I had dabbled in songwriting, mm -hmm. and I was never like that great of a songwriter, like with melody and lyrics and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. And I kind of it was appealing that with film music, you're there's no, you don't have to write a, a lyric, right? <laughs> so it's this, this background, you know, the the film, the actors, the dialogue. That's that's the lead vocalist, exactly. and the, the music gets us under that. So um, so yeah, two thousand four, I moved to Los Angeles, and um, did you come out here with any job in hand, or you just came out here with a pocket full of dreams, as they say? <laughs> or did you? I came out exactly yeah. a pocket full of dreams, <laughs> um, a little bit of savings from the music industry stuff, right. and. Um, you know, I still did a little music, music biz work. Yeah, yeah. A couple of remixes and productions here and there, but it was it was very scarce at that point. And um, then I got my first real composing job uh, two years later in 2006, working for Michael Levine. Oh yeah, Michael's great. Michael's great. Yeah, that's um, amazing. On the show Cold Case. Yeah, Cold Case. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you also worked with uh, Cliff uh, Martinez as well. How, when did you meet him, and what part of your career did that uh, was that section? I mean, it was kind of around the same time. Michael introduced me to Cliff. Yeah. Um, I think Michael had worked with Cliff. Um, I had discovered Cliff a few years before when I was in New York, mm -hmm. when I saw the movie Traffic. Yeah. And I was like, this score is very different. Right. This is really great. Who who did this? Cliff Martinez. I looked him up. And uh, and I became instantly fan. Yeah. Um, then I saw 
Solaris. And, you know, so I was just, wow, this guy is really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few years later, 2006-ish, Michael introduced me to Cliff. And we got along, and he heard some of my music, and and not that long after asked me to help him on a on a film. Right. So you did, like, programming and some additional writing for him. Um, and so when you worked with Michael and Cliff, and kind of that, kind of, that's kind of like your gateway into the industry, what do you... I mean, what were kind of the lessons that you learned at that time that you kind of carry with you today? Well, uh, I mean, there's the the craft yeah. of scoring, um, the, the um, how to create music that helps to tell a story, mm -hmm. um, uh, spotting, like where the music should start and stop, um, how it should get out of the way of the dialogue, um, how it should uh, evoke certain emotions in the in the viewer. Mm -hmm. um, I, le I learned a lot of that. Um, I also learned a little bit about, you know, watching them navigate the business and politics involved in, yeah, in being a composer. the business side of things is something I don't think you can be taught. Yeah, I mean, you have to like, experience it, and I mean, I guess you're, they were teaching you, but you were learning about it. But it's it's something that you don't really get taught in school. I mean, you have to really work in the business I mean be a businessman in this industry as well yeah so that must have yeah been just nice. watching I mean I wasn't involved in it yeah yeah and, and that was actually yeah. nice because the, because the pressure wasn't on you know <laughs> yeah. like all the responsibility was was on them yeah and um, but I just sort of watched and uh, and they would come back from a phone call or a meeting and say oh well the producer said this and the director mm -hmm. wants that and this and, and I had to do this and that to to try to understand what they meant and how to get them, you know. So it was uh, it was really interesting to, to sort of watch all that. Yeah. So, I mean, then you, I mean, you started an amazing solo career and, I mean, you've, I mean, you've dominated the, the TV landscape with so many amazing fantastic scores and some great film scores. And, um, and even you worked with Cliff on Far Cry, which is a great game, too. I love, I mean, that was a big team effort there, too. Um, so let's go through some of your, uh, some of your individual projects. I know a lot of people know you for American Horror Story, and I would love to, and, and of course, your stuff with Ryan Murphy and Brad Falchuk, I mean, how did you guys, how did you get involved with Ryan and, <laughs> or, uh, yeah, how did you get involved with with them, and and kind of talk about that uh, evolution of that relationship and working with them? Well, um, again, Cliff. Cliff, wow. Yeah, <laughs> so Cliff scored a Ryan Murphy film called The Normal Heart. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I helped him on that. Mm -hmm. And through that, met uh, some of uh, Ryan's, uh, one of Ryan's producers, mm -hmm. Alexis Martin Woodall. And um, the, you know, we, we finished that film, and uh, six months go by, and um, I just, the phone rings one day, and it's Alexis, and she says, uh, Hi, hey, how you been? You know, we're looking to go in a, in a different direction on American Horror Story this season. Would you, by any chance, be available to write a piece of music this afternoon? <laughs> so I said, "Yes, I'm. I'm available." Yeah. Um, I wrote a piece of music. They sent me a scene. Right. I wrote a piece of music, and and long story short, the next day they they hired me. Right. And w which season that was? That was uh, four, uh, four Freak Show. Freak Show, which is yeah. I mean that. That's an amazing season to jump on to. Um, American Horror Story is also unique because it, I mean, it, it kind of set the, the stage for this kind of anthology television series. I mean, we've had anthology kind of episodic television in the past, but to, to kind of really bring it to the mainstream. So, and you've worked on a couple seasons now. What's it been like to hit the restart button every time? And it's still American Horror Story, but every season it's almost its own thing. I mean, is there a connective tissue between the seasons? Do you feel it? a general arc between it, or do you treat everything like a completely different show? Um, you know, it, it is almost like doing a new show yeah. every every season. Uh, we, we have these conversations before things get rolling and start talking about, you know, the this, this story and the time period and the feel and, like, what kind of things Ryan is looking for. Mm -hmm. and, and that starts to define the parameters of, of what I like to call the musical universe. Right. Um, so from that standpoint, it's, a, it's just a new show again. Yeah. Um, then, then there are some, some things that, that I think are in all of the seasons that I've done. Yeah. You know, this, 
you know, this horror, a type of like horror sting, a certain type of discordant sound that that will shock the viewer, mm -hmm. scare them. You know, that I think has been in been in each season. But then the style of music and the palette of musical sounds, you know, that's pretty much changed each time. Yeah. And everyone also knows it for, I mean, one of the parts of working in television is you kind of follow the, the, the main theme, the main titles theme, which is uh, was done by Charlie Clauser. Um, do you rearrange that theme after every new one? Is that kind of on you, or does, is Charlie involved at all anymore with that theme? Well, the um, for, for Freak Show, mm -hmm. Charlie had done a new version. Oh, wow. I think... I think the first three seasons, uh -huh. had, it had pretty much stayed unchanged. Right. And then they decided to do uh, a refresh. Yeah. Um, and uh, he had done this great version that was very circus, yeah, carnival, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really great. Um, so when it came around to season five, Hotel, um, they, they asked me to do it. Wow. And so I took... Uh, I had already written some music for the for the season mm -hmm. and had established this new sound right. and they said let's take that sound and sort of somehow figure out how to put that into the main title and so I uh, I wrote a melody I used some of the sounds from that, that we'd already been working on right. and there we had the the hotel main title Wow. Um, and I, th I thought it turned out pretty well uh, when we got to the to uh, Roanoke yeah um, they wanted to do it again, <laughs> wow. and I, uh, I, I, so I did. I did the same thing. I I took stuff that I'd been working on for the season and 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 did it. And, th and they were like, "Well, this sounds great, but we want the melody." I'm like, "Well, this is what do you mean? Well, the one from Hotel, like that's now the new melody of the main title." And I was like, "Oh, wow. okay." That's so awesome. so they said so they love that. So I took that melody now, did it in a new way, and then did it again in Cult. So I think yeah. it was. It was like a synth in, in hotel. This kind of weird synth, in in Roanoke. It was a cello, and then for cult, it was a trumpet. Wow. With with various other sounds layered in to give it. The... That must be fun to just kind of re, kind of revisit it and kind of reestablish that kind of. I mean, it's like the first thing the audience hears, you know, when they start an episode. That must have been pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's such a great theme to begin with. Yeah. That main title. Right. So um, I was definitely a little nervous, uh, you know, each time really that yeah, I, I yeah. got to do it justice <laughs> yeah, because exactly. people people love it, um, and so I needed to do something that was going to honor the original music, but right. then take you know add this other dimension to it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we were just talking about American uh, Horror Story. Let's jump to American Crime Story. Um, you know, you're working on the assassination of Gianni Versace. You did O.J. Simpson uh, beforehand. So this is. A completely different genre of, of Ryan Murphy. There's so many genres of <laughs> Ryan Murphy. Um, I guess talk about working on these kind of true, I mean they're very dramatized, but talk about working on kind of true life drama based on true life events that everybody kind of is aware of and people live through it. I mean I was young when OJ Simpson happened and I know people have you know memories of Versace and all that so kind of talk about working on that and kind of building a sonic palette for a true crime drama. <laughs> well you know, as I as I as I work more and more with Ryan, uh -huh. and I and I get to experience and, and be a part of these of these projects that he has, um, li little by little, I'm, I I start to to have more insight into what he's doing and how he's, you know, what excites him. Yeah. And and yeah. Uh, I think it would be safe to say that. Especially with these true stories that he tells, the the, the two crime story seasons feud yes, and the true story. He likes to uh, take this story that on the surface is one thing, right? Yeah. And then he pulls all this other stuff out from underneath all these issues that were quite socially re relevant at the time that the mm -hmm. story actually happened, and then are still really relevant today. And so, like that's that seems to really excite him. Um, I mean, it happens on on horror story yeah. too, but there's something about the, these true stories that that he really gets in there and pulls these things out, mm -hmm. and um, and so both both seasons of Crime Story, uh, there, there was a lot of that, a lot, and it's pretty it's pretty interesting to watch him watch him do it. Right, and it's it's not 
as it's not as a stylistic thing as American Horror Story where you can kind of I guess go into weird sounds and stuff. I mean, where do you, how do you find the sound palette for these shows? I mean, you don't want the music to kind of manipulate me too, like kind of on the nose. I mean, it must be a pretty hard challenge to kind of find the right tone and then of course find the, the actual sound of the show. I mean, what, what do you look for? What are you pulling out of the show visually that kind of informs where your music comes from? Well, it, it always starts with the conversation mm -hmm. with Ryan and his, and his team about, about the story, um, about the time period, if that's right. going to be relevant to the, to the musical sound. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, genres of music or, or particular composers or artists or songs or whatever it is that they're feeling right. represents uh, you know, a, a direction to go in with the music. Right. So for uh, the assassination of Johnny Versace, um, there were there was a lot of talk about. Uh, it's a story about a serial killer. Yeah. And so um, we were we were thinking a lot about like Silence of the Lambs, like this creepy, you know, it's a very different story, right. but just like this really creepy individual that is hyper intelligent and manipulative. And yeah, and like seems like very benign, yeah. like when you just meet him. But then, like you know, at any moment he's like killing, and so uh, so that was kind of a touchstone. Um, I guess you operate in the genre. I mean, it is a very genre specific. So, and I was I was gonna ask. Like that's cool that you were looking at Silence of the Lambs. Like, are there any like kind of other kind of more co cultural phenomena that you kind of pull from? And like, oh, yeah, this is very genre specific, and as a crime story or something like that. Or something. Besides Silence of the Lambs, was there anything else that well, was like that he like as a talking point in those conversations? Well, that was, that was kind of one of the. It was like a triangle in this one, uh -huh. and that was one one corner, um, one point. And so then uh, Versace was a fan of opera, uh, okay. uh, and so here's the next point of the triangle is is like Italian opera, yeah, sort yeah. of Italian classical music, right. Um, and then the third point is the Ryan is a huge fan of Giorgio Moroder. Wow. And so he, of course, did some really classic soundtracks back in the, in the 80s, which is, which is a bit before the time period of, certainly of the, the murder. But, but some of the story does stretch back as far as the late 80s. Right. Um, and so... Uh, so, so that electronic sound of Giorgio Moroder was another, was another thing. So, I've kind of become fond of describing it as like Giorgio Moroder scoring Silence of the Lambs in an Italian villa. Like <laughs> I feel very, like yeah, that's very, kind very, of very, the... <laughs> that triangle. Is what, <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, that, that you find those such a unique palette that way. I mean, then it becomes its own thing. So, um, when you are s scoring a kind of a, a series like this, where you know, it's, it's broken into episodes, and of course, it's a complete story. It has an ending. It's an anthology series, so you're not going to have to worry about continuing the seasons. Um, how do you kind of, uh, I guess, in terms of spotting the music and then building the arc over the season? I mean, are you totally aware of all episodes, and like, do you know where the where the, the third act kind of climax is going to be towards the end of the season? Do you know these things so you can shape the score, or are they just kind of delivering it one episode at a time, and you're just kind of processing it that way? Um, you know, it would sound a lot more sophisticated if I said yes, <laughs> like I have a plan from the beginning and I right. know the arc and I, uh, but the truth is that's not, I mean, I know that's, TV is, yeah, that's like, not, rarely works that way. It's I not, I, there's very few instances where people are like, yeah, I, I was, I knew exactly what was going to go, but, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was kind of coming to me an episode at a time uh -huh. and, uh, and we were just doing it as, yeah, we were just doing it as, as we felt it right. and, I think that there's we're just finishing the final episode now, so that yeah. would be the the the, uh, the end of the arc. Uh -huh. So I guess we'll we'll look back over all of it after that and see if it's uh, <laughs> it you know what what it looks like, or or is it just a you know a sine wave? <laughs> so yeah, we were just talking about uh, assassination of uh, Gianni Versace. So I would, I would just love to um, maybe you could uh, just kind of talk through your I guess the writing process. I know every composer has a different process and it'll of course differ on every every project but for uh for Versace what was kind of your process like uh where did the first note come from kind of what is do you sit down and watch a scene reflect on it do you just noodle on the piano a little bit to find something and then 
try to picture kind of what's yeah talk about your process a little bit <laughs> yeah i mean uh that that describes it noodling around uh -huh. trying to come up with something uh in in this in this project um it it did start from some themes it doesn't it doesn't always mm -hmm. um i know that's like the scoring 101 way is to write write these themes and then everything gets mapped out to the theme Theme for characters yeah. um but uh in this in this project it, it did we did kind of kind of go that route and um i think the first thing i wrote was something for for andrew Kunanen, uh -huh. the uh, the killer. Right. So um, there. And then I wrote something for um, Versace, mm -hmm. and and also for his sister Donatella. And those kind of ended up being the main the main three themes mm -hmm. that uh, would vary and and move around throughout throughout the season. Right. So I want to maybe maybe walk through maybe one of the pieces that you wrote, just give, give maybe a little sample of uh, what you have going on. I mean, there was this really simple um, piano motif uh, initially for for Andrew. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, maybe it's it's a motif that wants to be a theme, but that that yeah. was like kind of kind of like a main thing for Andrew, right? And um, you know, it, it got used a lot in the episodes, um, and and then as we were working on it, uh, we felt we also we needed something uh, like so, like that that was working nice as a melody, but yeah. but something like really creepy that that could it could be could be used in conjunction with it or in, in place of it and um i stumbled across this sound we ended up calling it the andrew seagull sound Siegel but uh and it it just uh yeah, I mean, we were, we just used it incessantly. Yeah. yeah, it just became this great thing and different pitches and the speeds right. and, and everything. And it was, uh, so how do you know, like, that's such a subtle piece of music, so cute that how do you know when you, when you strike gold? Like, how do you know, like, okay, this is the final, because there can be so many variations to it and it can have such a different psychological effect on the audience and, and what you're trying to comment on the character. Um, because the reason why I love talking to composers because you guys are like psychologists. I mean, you guys are getting into the heads of what's gonna the emotional feel gonna be. I mean, how do you know that's you, that you that's perfect? You wait for Ryan to go. That's good. You got it. Or do you know kind of in your head that you struck it? Like you got it. Um, it it felt it felt good. Uh -huh. And then um, I think the first place that I used it, there was this shot of Andrew, and he was was pointing a gun and so the camera was right in front and you saw the gun you couldn't see his face and then he like leaned out and and so like that sound happened right as Andrew's yeah, so face like leans out so and I was like yeah, okay the action, yeah, yeah I think that's that's, that's gonna awesome. work <laughs> so um so it just became it became this uh, signature sound wow. kind of musical sound design I guess yeah. you, you might call it and um we had it everywhere. We ended up having to take, you know, take it, it was like too, okay. We got it was a little crazy. You know, it was a little, a little too much. Yeah, so. it'll become a spoof of itself. You keep doing it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so was that the was that was that it? Sorry. Well, well, I mean that's that was you know there were there were other things used for Andrew, but that was right. that was kind of the the motif that that got moved around a lot. Um, and then for for Versace. Um So vaguely Italian opera, opera classical yeah. sort of a sort of a thing. 
It's like in the like in the distance though. It almost feels like yeah, it's far away, but it's there. And and it's uh. It has a sense of a hint of tragedy. I mean, you're it's, you're kind of commenting on the tragedy of it a little bit. I think I mean, that's what I'm taking. It's on. it's definitely sad. Yeah, there's like a melancholic feel to it for sure. That's amazing. That's that's wonderful. <laughs> and you know, it got it got. It got used in, in various ways. Um, oh, here here's um, it, it, there, a lot of these themes got blended. Like we'd have the Versace, then hand off to Andrew, and then uh -huh. back to Versace, and then um, and you can sort of hear the in, in this section uh, the, the the Giorgio sort of influence. Yeah. I sit in here way too much, just, you know, playing with a... That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, just finding those different colors, like it's just the musical colors, I mean, that's great. Yeah. And I love the build, kind of, to, it's great for shaping scenes for sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this this particular cue was uh, was in the first episode as the police are chasing Andrew, trying to capture him. They've identified him as the killer, and they're right. trying to they're trying to catch him. Um, they you know they they don't end up catching him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right right away, but uh, so it's just like building tension and momentum and having the themes kind of come in and out. Mm -hmm. So talk about uh, spotting. I mean, we talked about spotting a little bit earlier. You mentioned spotting television. I, I feel like. It was such a quick turnaround time. Like, how quickly do you have to like when you sit down, spot an episode, um, and how much music I guess is per for 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 Versace specifically? How much music is kind of per episode that you're scoring original music? I, it it does vary. Mm -hmm. um, I could say probably uh, averaging but between twenty to twenty five minutes. It's a lot. For, so, something something like that. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I mean the I guess the dirty little secret is we don't do spotting sessions. Oh wow, that's fine. Um, and it happens more in that like it, it's this interesting workflow mm -hmm. where everything is evolving in the episode up to the final mix. Yeah, like the cut, the music, like all of it's evolving, wow. and so um, they may send me just a scene. Mm. And it may have some temp music in it. It may not. We'll have a discussion about the scene, ideas, and I'll write something. And I'll send, I'll send stems into them. Like it's a final mix, yeah. like right, right away. Wow. Rather than like a demo and then back and forth, I'll send it in. If they like it, great. We're on to the next. Now they have stems and they've put it into their, into their cut. The cut is evolving. The music's yeah. evolving too as they're, as they're cutting it. And now they send me more. They might send me an act. Maybe now they have the whole episode, and and it's the same kind of pro process, back and forth. Uh, and and music is going in. It's getting into the cut, and they're they're chopping it. Maybe it evolves to the point where um, what I've written is no longer really working, and now they have right. to give it back to me to write write it in a different way. Right. But it's just all. It's a little bit of this like free for all that takes us all the way up to. To when it's ready to be mixed, yeah. So it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting. So all hands on deck, shaping the cut and the music and the sound effects and the visual effects and all this stuff. It just kind of goes right up to. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, so what's like what's the turnaround from when you start working on an episode to when it has to be delivered finally and just finished? How much time do you have between start and finish? Like you're in the middle for scoring the last episode right now. You said. When you were going back to back to back, kind of what's the, the turnaround for each episode? 
I mean, the, you know, this this particular show is is not a typical case. Mm. Um, I mean, I think I first wrote some music for it as early as April or May of last year. Wow! Wow! Nine episodes. So I've been working on nine episodes on and off since then, and so it's really uh, it really varies. I mean, sometimes right. I've had as short as a week. And other time, I mean, this last episode, I've been going back and forth with them now since um, the end of December. So it just really... It's like, it's more like, a, almost like working on a film, right? You have a little bit more time to massage things and feel things out rather than, you know, that kind of typical TV thing that you always hear about where it's like, yeah, get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on, on this one, this one is not, not typical. Right. The, you know, the other Ryan shows, Mr. Robot, they're more, you know, we're... That air date's coming up. We yeah. gotta, we gotta get it. We gotta right. get it done. So you did mention Mr. Robot. And we have to talk about Mr. Robot. It's such a hugely popular sh a series, and and I, and I have to tell you because I was sitting in my cube at work not too long ago, maybe like three weeks ago, and my producer from the shorts department comes over and he's, guy, do you have do you have Matt Quayle's soundtrack to Mr. Robot? And I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I need, I need it. I need to work to it because I, I love that score. And I'm like, so. And I mean, people have really attached themselves to it. And uh, talk about that that series. It's a uh, very unique, and I mean, it really lends itself to your style. I think. And I mean, how did you kind of find that hacking, technological, modern sound for for the show? Well, um, you know, as with with all of the shows, it's a very collaborative process. Yeah. And um, Sam Esmail, the creator of Mr. Robot. Uh, in our in our very first meeting, uh, he knew he wanted a uh, an electronic sound. Right. Um, he knew that it would be a little bit retro, but also quite modern and futuristic, yeah. and that it would um, have it would be pretty tense. Yeah, it's a it's very tense. Very tense score. Um, and so with with those parameters as the jumping off point, I I started writing music, and. Uh, and then there's back and forth, a lot of back and forth, shaping it, getting it right for the for the various scenes and whatnot. And out of that, we we, you know, the pilot was the first, the first thing, and we had this body of music that, that was the sound. And right. from from there, just, uh, yeah, there was our, our formula was kind of in place that we certainly for season one that we. Does I mean as a series of I mean this is a you know continuing series it's not anthology not an anthology one so you're kind of evolving continuing how does the music change as the series continues is it continually evolving are you bringing in new elements every season are you trying to find a new way to, to kind of continue the story or do you just kind of have your sound palette that you work with and just work with whatever the picture is um, the the electronic sound has remained. The core. Right. Uh, in season one, it was pretty much the, the whole sound. The, the only or, organic instrument was a piano. Mm. and But not really like someone sitting down playing something pianistically. Yeah. But it was a piano sound. It was quite processed. Played some simple motifs. And, and the rest of it was just synthesizers. Yeah. Um, in season two, uh, we made a conscious choice to to bring in some some more organic elements on top of the core electronic mm -hmm. sound, and so um, there was now the use of some some like orchestral type strings. Mm -hmm. um, I believe I recorded a cello on one cue, and then there were some cues where the the, the piano uh, had was was done in a more pianistic way so yeah. played uh someone someone playing a, a piano cue that was right. just basically someone playing playing a piano and um and i think we in season three we we continued that even more so there was more of an organic feel on top of this core electronic sound right and um I mean, and it's, I, I love I love Mr. Robot, so it's it's just great that how your music kind of brings that world to life. I really love it so much. Yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a fan of the <laughs> of the show. I think um, there's definitely a lot of Elliot uh, Elliot in in me. I feel <laughs> I identify with him somewhat. Um, so I mean, before the camera started rolling, kind of let's move to a little bit more kind of general kind of approach questions. You were mentioning last year that you you know you were juggling a lot of things and 
working in television can be stressful and stuff. So as, as a composer in this industry, how do you kind of manage that? How do you manage time and manage working on, I mean, do you, do you juggle projects at time or do you try to keep it where you're only working at one at a time? And kind of how do you manage, I mean, your father, I mean, like manage personal life too. That must be a challenge as well. It's challenging. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I think pretty much anyone working that has more than one project, they, they will tell you that you it's almost impossible to keep them from happening at the same time. Yeah, so there, have, there has to be overlap. There's overlap. Yeah. And um, even if your best laid plans seem like, oh, we've, I've scheduled this project for here, and then I've scheduled this project for here, yeah. and then the next thing you know, first project has been pushed. And so now first project is on top of second project. Right. I mean, that, it's, it's really hard to, uh, to plan for any of that. Um, and so for me, uh, a, a big part of it has been, um, you know, having some help. Yeah, you know, I, I was helping Cliff. I was helping Michael Levine. And I think that's uh, that's the only way I've been able to manage, oh, yeah, you know, the, the workloads to have yeah. is to have some some team members that can uh, that could get in on uh, some additional composing mm -hmm. uh, here and there. And you know, I have an assistant who's doing uh, some additional composing, but then also everything else like prepping sessions and handling administrative stuff and right. like, trying to take all these other things off my plate so I can focus on 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 music and. Yeah, so I mean that's the that's kind of like the physical part of it. What about the mental part of it, where you have to switch from one world to the next, and then you have to start writing? You know, you can be doing American Horror Story, you have to jump to feud. I mean, like, is it difficult? Is it easy for you to switch kind of gears like that, or is it kind of like okay, I have to get in this headspace and then meet? I mean, or is it more challenging? <laughs> it's it's challenging. I mean, if it's um, if it's uh, like a, some really concentrated writing. Mm -hmm. In, on, on one show and then concentrated writing on another show uh, I need a little space yeah. you know like I need to you know I'll spend the morning on Horror Story and then the afternoon on Feud with lunch in, in between right yeah, um, it's every set. <laughs> if it's just you know maybe some quick revisions or a few little things like then I might find myself jumping you know if I'm working on three shows at once you know I may do a little something on one thing and then jump to the other and then jump back and 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 kind of it's a, it's a little it can be a little crazy but my I'm able to somehow muscle through <laughs> yeah <laughs> you definitely do no, I mean for sure um, so just kind of looking at the the industry as a whole um, uh, you, you've been working in the industry kind of you you learned a lot kind of working through Cliff and Michael and kind of on your own, is there any kind of trends that you're seeing in television? I mean, we're, people say we're in the golden age of television. Do you see some trends that are good in television? Are there anything bad that you're seeing as a like, as a professional in this industry? What are your kind of opinions on the on the TV industry specifically, kind of today in 2018? I mean, I think that um, there's so much television now. Yeah, there is a lot, <laughs> and so it's harder for anything to get noticed. I mean, I think there's a lot of great shows out there and probably a bunch of them aren't really getting noticed because it's just, it's hard to, it's hard. Yeah. It's so, there's so many things. Um, certainly, uh, I enjoy watching shows. I can't... Do you, you have know, time to watch shows? <laughs> I mean, I, I, watch a, I watch a few things. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, yeah, there's no way I can watch all, all the things I want to because no, there's, there's so there's so much like, of it. There's Netflix and Hulu and then HBO and Amazon. It's like you're always trying to keep up. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a long list of things <laughs> uh, that I that I still want to see that I haven't, and um, hopefully I'll I'll get around to them. But I, I think in music, uh, I mean, I think it's a great time. There's so much great music that's being written for television. Um, a lot of film composers are, uh, you know, people have, that were more primarily film or, right. are doing stuff for TV. I think that producers uh, are asking for music that's more film-like, so, that, so the soundtracks have become more cinematic. Yeah, yeah, for which sure. I, which I think is great. Um, I think there's a lot of auteurs that are really working in television now that, I mean, not just, I, mean, I guess it'd be you an auteur, but also like Ryan Murphy, like his vision and his style is so unique and special and you're getting these really great storytellers I think working and, and doing great work I mean yeah 
There's some great films, of course, but you have to, you know, it's, I feel like it's such a giant gap between the Marvel movies and the indie movies here, like, whereas, like, in television, there's a lot of consistent greatness going on, so I think that's really cool. That's what I'm seeing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, um, the, you know, a lot has been said and written about that, that that middle ground of filmmaking yeah. has been sort of you know just kind of disappeared right and and so the middle class yeah. th those those filmmakers are now working you know in television That's and doing true. and doing what they would have been doing in in film yeah um I'm, obviously there's exceptions but for sure but yeah. i think but i think that's happening and there's such good quality everything writing yeah. and directing and cinematography and music and so it's pretty yeah it's been a pretty exciting time for a while i mean you know, is it a bubble? Like, like, what's gonna yeah, happen? Is it gonna is it's it gonna burst so at fast. some point? Yeah, oh. it's always interesting. The technology is growing, and everything is just barreling forward. So it is interesting. I, it's, I always find it fascinating to see where this ended. Like, where is it gonna go? But it's it's uh, right now. I think it's a great time to be a, a watcher and a person working in, in the industry as well. So <laughs> without a doubt, for sure. Um, so uh, just to kind of wrap things up. Um, you know, we, we, we did, you did mention some things that you learned kind of early on from Cliff and Michael, but knowing what you know now and at this point in your, your career, what are the kind of most valuable core lessons that you kind of hold to that you've learned through experience that you would teach to your assistants or other composers that are coming up in the industry? Um, you know, someone said something years ago that really stuck with me, mm -hmm. um, which you know, isn't exactly championing championing artistry, but uh, the saying was, it's not what you can do, it's how fast you can do it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's just always there as this little, this little voice, because, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, if you're talented, uh, anyone can sit in their studio or, and, and spend weeks, like, perfecting a piece and yeah. producing it and uh, but you don't always have that right. you know often you don't you have to you have to do it you have to do it quickly yeah. and so that's um that's something that's kind of always on my mind mm -hmm. that like i know they want it and i need to and i need to give it to them and they need to be happy with it so it right. has to be good but yeah, yeah. it has to it has to happen quickly um and then the other thing is that um i it, in the forefront of my mind I am, I'm serving the story that I'm, that I'm composing for right. and the storyteller. So yes, I, as, as an artist am creating music and expressing myself, right. but it's all to serve this story. And so if the storyteller loves how I've expressed myself as an artist, fantastic. If they want me to change what I've done, fantastic. Like I will... I will do th for them. I'm not. Pu I'm not making my own record to release. I'm right. making the music for their story, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that uh, that's an important thing to try to keep the ego in check. If I if I feel like I've <laughs> written something that is fantastic and they say it's not, then that's you know that's great. Yeah. I need to I need to change it. And um, fortunately, the storytellers I work with they give me really good notes. So they help me make the music better. So Absolutely. it works out. It yeah. works out well for everyone. It's just a very simple thing to, that you guys are storytellers, and um, yeah, that's a very important thing to keep in the form. Because you're a storyteller, the cinematographer, the storyteller, everybody's a storyteller, and you guys are telling stories, the whole team. So, um, but uh, Mac, I want to thank you so much for for talking this evening, and uh, I know you're so busy, so I really appreciate your time. So it's just great to pick your brain for a little bit. Well, thank you. It's been it's been a lot of fun. Great.